All right. Hello, everybody. So I'm Alex. Um, I am not going to talk too much about myself. Um, I'm, um, I'm a principal engineer at Colibra, uh, but I'm not going to talk um, on use cases I'm doing at Colibra because it's too early for that. I'm going um, to show some of my use cases that I run through my career. And I think, I don't know the first time I touched actually Dataflow because before it was Apache Beam, it was the Dataflow SDK. It was uh, when Dataflow was actually even in early access. So I think it's seven, maybe eight years that I've been using Apache Beam. Um, so I'm a pretty big fan. Um, disclaimer, this is a, a, my complete personal Beam story from beginning till end. And I'll try to do to be linear because you will see kind of a build up of the experience uh, you grow on and, and using Beam technology. And actually we, we've grown with the technology as well because it was simple in the beginning and there's more and more and more features came along and we'll try to use as much as possible. So we're going to purely have my personal view and you will not learn the hottest insights in the technology because that's where the beam college is for right so so and i want to start with kind of a famous quote because i've been, been doing presentation about beam and data uh, pipelines for some years now and i have kind of a skewed view because i'm doing actually beam from the beginning, so I haven't been touched for, uh, by Spark because it was very, very early. Uh, do, been doing some uh, Hadoop, so in the whole technology I jumped right into into Beam. And doing some presentation, and actually sometimes don't realize how powerful the model was because, like, uh, did a presentation, and at the, at the end somebody came came to me and said, like, you are doing two lines of code for a session, and we're building like months to have like a sessionization and sessionization is one of the powerful winnowing functions from beam that is just so natural comes so natural to you you just like uh, do everything in a session of so much time blah 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 and it's done and it just works and it's it's not actually obvious when you use it that it's sometimes very hard to do um technology wise that was actually kind of a very fun uh, moment. Been using Dataflow from the beginning as well. Um, like I said, like we were in early access uh, from the beginning, but that doesn't mean you, you you trust the technology blindly though. So we've been running it uh, for some while. And if you see, and actually you should look at the dates actually. I've, like I said, I'm doing it for years. But I really like Dataflow for its uptime. So uh, it it sometimes breaks my heart when I do need to upgrade kind of one of the data flows that been running for like ages. Like uh, I think I topped like seven hundred days or something. But then you need something to change, like an extra field, and then you do need an upgrade, and you lose your uptime, of course. But but it shows for the reliability, and also uh, updates are, are really magic. Um, those are streaming, though. Um, and when you go streaming, you you think about Windows, and some use cases do require like very huge, um, huge uh, windows. So um, I was working in retail before, and our sales were open for like about ten days, and then we had like ten days to handle some some things after that. So we don't want to have like large windows. We wanted to see the technology fitted so we tested those things there's actually a medium uh, block it's pretty old uh, to experiment and see if beam could handle our very large windows and it, it didn't break, break a sweat so we were monitoring constantly in in stack driver and see do our disk keep uh, on does the memory use it so um, hold on it really well so so it's always best to kind of stress test your technology before you're going to dive and commit into it and that's what we did so here's here's my trip into to memory lane so beginning like standard uh, sql databases you want to get data out that's batch that's 
that's what we did before we actually jumped into Beam. Um, so that was kind of daily workloads, kind of boring, certainly if you're talking to people now. Um, but in retail and like a lot of other other businesses, more and more data is kind of real time. And in retail, is typically people are visiting your website, clicking on products. You want to see how sales behave, how marketing uh, um, campaigns influence your data and your users. So that's more real time. Um, so one of the things, the first thing we actually focused on was kind of our click stream, right? So even if you have like batch workloads and slow moving workloads, if you have uh, some use cases that are streaming, um, that's a very good thing to begin with. Um, and, and here is actually the session, the session part, uh, come the session part in it, because you look at, look at a user and you follow a journey of a user on your website, but you have to kind of compartmentalize it a bit. When do you stop? Like, when does a session of a user stop? When, when does it go away? Uh, we said like after 20 minutes, if there's no data anymore, we stop the session and that's one user session. And that's that one line that, uh, that, I, that I talked about. So it was just one, one uh, slice. So we split up the data with raw data. We went directly real time into BigQuery. So you can actually, even if a click was done, you could query it in BigQuery. But the sessionization was then going to another data flow. It kept the data until you had like enough the data, the session was closed and hop, uh, another table in, in BigQuery where hop, you have the, the, the data sessionized. It's very nice. So it's a very good use case to begin with, with streaming. Um, with the experience that we we had, we, we saw when we re-architectured some of, of our things that we wanted to go to microservices. Well, we, we came from a monolith and we go to microservices and we thought, hey, we have now this, this streaming experience. Let's let's make sure that our, our, our streams that are each and every microservice produced is as like a, a real schema attached to it. And we just stream it out that can go between microservices, but we actually can capture that stream and then go directly to, to our data warehousing. So because we didn't want to have like people touching the raw data because that was owned by the developer or microservices to, to stream the data out. So uh, we, we were pretty lucky that the architecturing, re-architecturing of our work came just behind. We, we built up that experience with streaming. So, so it was kind of for us a, a natural fit. And uh, what we started to do is, of course, stream things into BigQuery. Um, and, um, and also at some specific use cases for like making search available um, on our data. So we streamed part of it to, to, uh, uh, to Elasticsearch. Instead of like building those into our microservices, we picked it up in the stream did some processing in, in, in data flow and put it into Elastic. And another one was making it uh, accessible in, in big table for like a unique message extraction. If you're streaming data, um, you have the opportunity to actually back up. So, so that's the way we tapped in the same data stream, wrote a very simple, data flow now we have templates we we did it before like there there are uh, data flow templates um uh, but but we streamed it put it aside if we really needed to get our data back uh, we just could read it from cloud storage and there's actually there's always like talk you have a unified model between kind of streaming and streaming and batch processing here's where the unified model really comes in handy um, if you really want to work start with with beam think of think streaming first and not like you have the unified model but if you're streaming first after a while you come to a conclusion hey i've built this pipeline i have extra requirements so we need to adapt our use case, but we know that this extra requires maybe an extra filter I calculate, 
we can replay that from the data that we backed up. And that's where the, the patch component comes in, right? So you've backed it up. You set like new requirements. OK, we have the same data flow. We have the, the new one, the adapted one with the new requirement. Just replay our backup through that, that pipeline. And voila, you have like your new, new data from, from the backup. And, and, and you, do that, you do that automatic automatically with the same code. And, and, and that's where it's, it's really, really turns out really great. And the unified model comes out uh, very nice. Uh, the, after a while, so th this, is, this is what we, we try to do, like create KPIs out of it. So that was actually before Beam SQL. Um, but we, we stopped at, at that moment of like doing calculations at that time, because then we wrote too much code. And before it, you know it, you had like a lot of code. Now it's pretty much pretty easy with Beam SQL. And it really matches with what we have in BigQuery. So now you have the same uh, Zeta SQL that BigQuery is using and Dataflow is using. So you can now kind of create kind of the, 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 the same, same sequels. The same SQL statement that is more actually is a better abstraction to define KPIs. KPIs meaning key performance indicators of your business, right? So it could be like uh, how many people are visiting this and this. So as a high hindsight is kind of simple, those were our, our biggest injection points through this, what our entities, our clickstream, and like some integrations with, with, with uh, like our payment provider messaging systems. And, and so they, they all went into one stream. Uh, we were using pops up uh, to stream them on and then uh, like a lot of data flows reading, reading from there and then a conclusion like we we are uh, three endpoints uh, our biggest uh, dump of data big query big table for some real time very quick extractions and search elastic spanner eventually we, we were planning to do that but actually the, the first three covered our, our, our use cases after years but because Remember, those things take years to actually kind of build up in a business with different people because yeah, business grows. After a while, and Beam got like more EQ, uh, mature, and we as well, um, we start to see like a lot of patterns. Uh, we had schemas, and we see like lots of reoccurring patterns occur, and then you start thinking, damn, should I express my 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 kind of things that I would like differently. Um, and, and that's what we started to do was actually on our schema say, um, we want to have this and this, this field to do something about that. Instead of them building those codes by hand, we actually wanted to drive our, our pipelines by, this, by, the, by the contracts. Some, some, some. Uh, so it's like it's like a big mindset, right? Before you were writing code or something, and after a while you had like a transformation, had another transformation, another transformation. And before you know it, you have like a collection of transformations. But we wanted to actually replace that by actually things driven by by your schema. Right? So you have a user, you have its address, and say that address needs to be a number uh, that number should be uh, positive um, that user is personal identifiable information want to encrypt that uh, and so and we express that actually in the schemas and and what's what we then read it in in our transforms we start to actually build our code dynamically without hurting any developers and then each schema, because after a while you have like 60, hundreds of different kinds of schemas, yeah? because Beam grows with your business, your experience grows, grows with, uh, with the business. And after a while you have like lots of schemas and lots of data running through it. And all those 
small unique characteristics um, and um, but when the, you find the patterns you can then express your desires in the schema and build all those pipelines so so what are the use cases we kind of built on that method driven or that meta model so one already mentioned like data quality um, data quality is more and more important. Certainly, if you're going to do machine learning on your data, you want to have it as clean as possible, and you want to avoid dirty data. And and catching them in your pipelines with with alerting uh, is is a, is a very good place to to do it because your data is streaming through it anyway. If you do do, do data quality checks at that point, you have it real time checks. So at the moment, there are things kind of dirty on your data if you have written your your expression good uh, like uh, uh, it needs to be bigger than this uh, smaller than this it needs uh, to comply to a regex for for example an account number uh, needs to comply to this regular expression if not put it in a, a dead letter queue and have alerting on that other things that are meta driven is like having go beyond logical types. Uh, if you stream data directly out of a database, um, have, there are things like, like this kind of different uh, timestamps. Um, you can make your data flows aware of, hey, if I see this pattern, so we use the Bayesian, it's very popular in, um, in, in change data capture. If you see this uh, uh, this pattern, uh, the Bezium time zone timestamp, okay, that is a timestamp, and then we make sure if it lands into the, the query that it is a, a timestamp and not a string or a number or something binary. Uh, we want to make sure that, uh, that that is correct or clean and ready to be consumed. The, the the nice thing thing that we ever built meta driven was was our, our GD, GDPR use case and and there are some so in Europe and probably in the rest of the world there's some other uh, but but they will probably all all be similar uh, um, customers have the right to to be forgotten so if you're a customer and they say forget me. Um, we need to cl cl clean data, but but it's it's not it's not black and white because we need to clean some data, but companies need to keep uh, stuff uh, handy. Like for example, invoices you need to keep invoices for years, so you cannot delete the user completely. So what we did was kind of encrypt each user with their own key, and. Um, the user that wanted to be forgotten, we deleted the key of that user, and we made sure in our pipelines that we only encrypted the data that are really personal identifiable information, and not, for example, the invoice, because we, we were legally obliged to keep, keep it. So what about our building blocks? Is Of course, the schema options, like the schema meta. In the contract, we said, like, this field is personal identifiable information. And then we used like uh, Google Think. It's like an encryption library that is very compatible with uh, with BigQuery. Um, some Beam state for processing because each user had their own key, and that that's what we used uh, state for processing for. We have state like the key is a state. Uh, we put that key in Big Table, and why in Big Table? Uh, because it's federatable with BigQuery, so you could actually join a big, uh, big table, table in BigQuery and have the key in there to join it, and then you could make views that were automatically encrypted. If you deleted the the key out of uh, of Big Table, well, uh, the data kept encrypted. It's still there, but nobody can ever extract it anymore. So and. Um, we use the same mechanism as like the data quality uh, checks. So just go over the schema, see if it's uh, it's PII information, and then um, and then only transform those fields within your schema. Um, 
So all based on the, the row model that is uh, uh, th that comes out of the box with uh, with Bing. So if there is no each each schema we went over there, there are there are maybe some without personal identifying information, and you had like a transform, nothing in there. Okay, it's just passed through, no changes. And uh, if there is information, we just go over each field. This is a naive implementation, but it, it works pretty well. Uh, there is performance tuning you can do. Um, but what, like you uh, have, then you encrypt it for that user with that view. And that's kind of the, that's when you want to optimize it, you can do kind of byte body change codes, but we're not going to get into this. Um, so now it changed kind of job. So it's it's like, it's like a personal uh, journey. I'm not working in retail anymore, um, but are st I'm still using Beam. Um, and it's a bit too early, but to it's operational wise. Um, so there is now kind of a trend in operations to to generalize kind of the structure. And that's that's very nice uh, because I like schema-driven designs. So tracing metrics and and logging, um, there will be all combined in an open or the open telemetry project. And we are actually using internally Beam to do deep analysis on operational data. So that's that's probably will do some presentations like. Uh, at the next beam summit, or maybe the one after that, because maybe it's too early for the next one. Voila! So there's a this is a, a very very quick overview of, of about like seven years <laughs> to to squeeze like seven years in like uh, 15, 20, 20 minutes. It's kind of a challenge, um, but uh, but that was it. So you probably noticed I'm I'm a big fan of beam. Um, certainly because it's kind of the, uh, the abstraction, the programming model, um, been using kind of it all since recently only on Google, um, but because I'm now kind of more multi-cloud, right? So um, having the option to keep the same programming model and run it anywhere, like uh, like on, on Flink or Spark uh, is certainly, certainly a big benefit. Voila. So thank you. So um, I think I can turn it over to for questions now.